What I'm gonna to talk to you all about today is Agile and knowledge management and uh, how, how we at Enterprise Knowledge mix them together for all phases of implementing our knowledge management projects and, and really how you can do it yourselves at your organizations. Let's stop in. Who am I? Joe Hilger, I'm a principal at Enterprise Knowledge. I'm also a uh, certified Scrum Master uh, since well, I guess 2011, 2012, and have been in the knowledge management space mostly doing technical development uh, for over 20 years, which starts to say how old I am, uh, and been consulting for about 25. So one of the things I found is we were doing development a lot, and I said someone stumbled into Agile. I think that we were doing work at uh, McGraw-Hill, and they said, oh, this Agile thing really works, and it was 2008. I said, you know, latest fad, what is it? And it really made a difference. And so part of the reason I'm giving this talk is I want to share what I've learned about Agile with you. And, and as part of that, really teach Agile. I think a lot of people hear about Agile, and they assume Agile means it's faster, quicker. There's actually some concepts that you need to know to do it right. And then talk about how you can apply it to all of your KM initiatives. Does that make sense to everyone? Good. So before I get started, how many people here are Scrum Masters or have some sort of Agile certification? I think I know there's at least one. Got one? Do you, do you have one as well? Two? Okay. You're the ringers. Don't steal the prizes. Um, for the rest of you, how many people have been involved in an Agile project or feel like you know a bit about it? Raise your hand. Okay, so we've got a few. But it's worth a quiz. Let's find out how much everyone really knows. So what we're going to start with is I've got four simple questions that are meant to talk a little bit about what Agile is and kind of get us thinking about what it is. So uh, what I'd like you to do is raise your hand if you think the answer is true and keep it down if it's false so we can get a sense of what people know. And don't copy these two, right? So um, first question, true or false? Agile is a new process or methodology to improve the way IT projects are run. Let's hear it. True or false? True? Raise your hand. False? Keep it down. You're right. It is, in fact, false. This better not be this easy. Um, so why is it false? IT. Do you know? What? You don't need IT in there anymore. You don't. That's part of it. But that's only half the reason it's false. Pardon me? It's, there you go. That's, that's another part. Maybe I made this too easy. There were three reasons. And then... The last reason is it's not a process, and it's not a methodology, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And the biggest mistake people make when going into Agile is they go, where's my project plan? Where's my checklist of things I'm supposed to do? All that's wrong. If you think that's what you have to do, we've got some explaining to do in a few minutes. So let's try question number two. And I guess, okay, raise your hand if this is true. Agile can be used to transform both business and technology organizations. I think we all know the answer, since uh, I think Karen gave that away as the quick answer. Yes, and that's, uh, you know, that's important. It started out, it really did start out, if you actually see the Agile Manifesto, they talk about IT. That was the idea. But then along the way, IT started making progress and doing things better, and others said, wow, maybe this can work in other places. Uh, and you, you've got great stories of uh, airlines doing it for their marketing and customer service, uh, stories of legal teams figuring out how to actually process legal documents faster and just be smarter about work they do. So absolutely, Agile can be used definitely outside of IT. So Agile projects are more risky because they often start without a detailed plan, true or false. Someone's got to get something wrong here. I, I really struggle. Okay, the answer is false. Um, one of the concepts of Agile that makes it uh, so valuable is, uh, and we, we've all done this, and I'm going to talk about this. You know, you, you sit down and you write a six-month plan. Anyone ever done that? Right? You got a plan, six months, and what we're going to be doing four months from now is this. Maybe you know, a little later that. Do you actually really know what's going to happen in six months? I, mean, I, I struggle two weeks. Right? That's about the furthest I can see sometimes. And the idea with Agile is jump in early, and they call it fail early, fail fast. The idea is 
find out what you don't know as soon as possible so that you can adjust quickly. And so the reason these projects are less risky, even though you haven't spent all this time planning, is because you haven't spent all this time planning. You've actually started to figure out what's happening and been able to adjust as a result. So last question. OK, maybe someone will get this wrong. Uh, agile projects are always less expensive than waterfall projects. So are they less expensive, true or false? True? <laughs> OK. You, you are correct. They're not. And in fact, um, we did some work um, working with the CTO at GSA, helping put in some of their Agile transformation. And one of the things we talked about is Agile isn't always the right answer. If you have a project that's very well understood and you know the tasks that you have to do and the outcomes of those tasks, then it's rather wasteful to iterate and circle around and say, try this and try that, because you don't need that extra work. So in certain cases, waterfall can actually be faster and cheaper. Is that true of the change always statistically? Yes, I would say, well, yes and no. Uh, when, so let me, yeah, let me answer that. There you go. I'm going to give you a half hand. Okay. And the reason I hesitated on that is uh, what agile projects do is they deliver value and ROI sooner. So you have a working product sooner along in the process, which means at any point you can say I've delivered. So if you need to stop three months in, you've got something that works and they call it the minimum viable product. Right? I hate that name. It sounds negative, but it's actually a really positive thing. I have a working thing. Having said that, with Agile projects, you get your budget. You're typically going to iterate and keep adding new features to the end of your budget. You don't have to spend less money. You can probably get more stuff that's more relevant on the process. So I would say Agile's less about spending less money. It's more about getting the features and capabilities you need more targeted for what you want. Does that answer my half answer? <laughs> Good. Okay. So I've tried to come up with a couple slightly more difficult questions. And for these, we have gifts. So what, what I'm going to do is ask the question, raise your hand, and the winner gets either a t-shirt in this beautiful weather or a nice, very warm enterprise knowledge hat with all of our colors on it. So um, question one. Uh, so the Agile Manifesto has four values, and we're going to talk about it in a minute. Can anyone name at least two of them? Raise your hand if you know and can speak to the, at least two of the four Agile Manifesto values. Anyone? No one? I value x over y. Does that ring any bells? OK. OK, fair enough. Um, can anyone name one of them? <laughs> I want to give away a hat. Change. Can, work with me here. We, we value change. No. Oh, uh, we'll go through this. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Right? Responding to change. And you know what? You want a hat? That's as close as we were going to get today. <laughs> so. Let me, let me toss this your way. The next one's easier. So all the other questions you get right, this one is um, the one where the money is. I picked a bad one. Next up, so Agile's really focused on teams. And that's actually where we start to differ a little bit from KM. Um, and Agile has kind of standardized on what's a good team size to be effective. And it's based on a lot of psychology and other research. Does anyone know what the maximum team size, is, maximum recommended team size on an Agile project is? That's, uh, no, it's seven, seven's close. Nope, plus or minus, <laughs> plus or minus, two, thank you, yes. So it, that's actually, like I said, it's not just an Agile thing, that's where it came from. Uh, are you interested in? T-shirt, a hat, <laughs> and we got, Karen, we got a two from you. There's, did you get it? There you go. T-shirt or hat? You want the hat. Do you want a T-shirt? 
Thank you. So the tossing's for the video, by the way. There you go. Great. Okay. And so the answer, 7 plus or minus 2, would be 9. Uh, and yes, it comes outside of the Agile realm that they came up with that. So good. We learn from others. Okay. No more quizzes. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the Agile Manifesto. So in, in, in the history of Agile, uh, I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was in the late 90s, so it is not new. Um, a bunch of uh, very well-known project managers said, how are we going to work better? Because all our IT projects fail. What can we do that can change the way we, we do things? And they met for a week, and, and what they realized is there was no single process that fixed things. It actually was a way of acting. It was a mindset or a way of working together that really changed things. And this really starts to meld with KM when we get into this, you'll see. But so let's, let's talk about what they said. Um, as, as someone who believes in Agile, I value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Um, and what, what, what Agile isn't, and really important, it's not like a set of checklists, must do these things. Because we recognize that when you truly believe in people and you want to empower people, they'll make good decisions on their own. Right? I think we were talking earlier, you went to lunch with some of, your, some of the people you went to class here with, right? It's good to get back together. Right? Don't you get more from those interactions than from any kind of written, must do this requirements? Right? That, that level of interacting is so much more valuable and so much better learning than, than otherwise. So people said, when we put projects together, make sure those project teams talk, both to themselves and to others and focus on enabling that over worrying about making sure everyone does every check in the, in the list of things they have to do. Um, working software over comprehensive documentation. So um, who here has worked for a big, large integrator? I worked for EDS. I mean, we got Accenture in the room probably at some point, right? And you know, any of these big integrators, what they typically end up doing, they have thousands of employees, so they give you your process, right? They have their methodology. And you better do everything in it. How often are you filling out a document that's part of the required documentation for your application? You have no idea why you have to do it, right? We've all got that. Well, that's not valuable. So a lot of people misread this and go, oh, since I'm doing Agile, I don't have to write anymore. That, that's not true. What they want you to do is focus on what you're trying to deliver. And however it is you need to do that, do it. So we're doing a big Agile project at GSA I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And we are documenting stuff. We're writing some designs because people need to see it. They need that information to make decisions. But we're, we're also not writing some standard SDD that was required because it's on page 17 of the project manager handbook of whatever, right? That's not valuable. We're writing the information people need to, to do what they want or what we want them to. Um, Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Uh, everyone hates negotiation. How many people have ever done an IT system where the IT came, true came, crew came over to you? This could have been me at one point and said, give me your requirements, right? OK, don't miss any, because I'm going to hold you for, to them, right? And we're going to sign a deal that says, you're going to sign off on these requirements, right? And so you do these great requirements. You've got it nailed. and then. Three months later, you start to see what they're building. You go, well, I didn't need half this stuff. I didn't know what the system was, right? Or, or hey, this, this enables us to change this process. What could we do differently, right? Or we change the process and we don't need this, right? I wish I could change, but I got that contract, right? No, that's a horrible way to work. That's not how you get things done in a positive way. Um, this is about figuring out how to jointly problem solve both the business and IT, right? But that could also be, both the KM office and their users and the knowledge workers, right? It doesn't have to just be business and IT. Lastly, responding to change over following a plan. Um, in Agile projects, what you're typically doing is uh, you're iterating, and at the end of each kind of sprint or iteration, you'll hear this term, and uh, at the end of that sprint, 
you, you go back and you say to your end users, this is what we did, this is what we think we're doing next, are we right? And, and what this means is you're giving the business a chance to adjust based on what they've learned and what you've learned. So you don't have to say, four months from now we will definitely be working on widget A because because that's in the plan, right? It might be that you get there and you go, we don't need widget A anymore. So let's throw it out, right? So the idea is let's plan to change. And in the, in the world we're working in, that's pretty important. And when we get into KM projects, you can picture how often are you pushing an initiative and you get a surprise? Are you ready to change your plan? Maybe with a different approach it could be. So couple more slides on Agile and then we're going to move and talking about KM together. But I really think getting this foundation in place for those that maybe aren't as familiar with this is important for the rest of the conversation. So uh, one of the advantages of um, an Agile approach is, uh, is kind of how you build things, right? And, and I'm still going to talk tech because I'm still a tech geek at the end of the day. But, but we can apply this in, in many ways, right? Um, in, in a non-agile world, right, or in, in, a, in a waterfall world, if I were building a plane, well, I'd start with a jet engine. That's a critical piece. I've got to get that done first, right? And then I'd probably build seats, and they'd hopefully be pretty good seats for the, for the jet, right? And, and if my users looked, they'd see a jet engine and seats, right? And I'd say, did we get it right? You'd look at me and go, well, it looks like a good seat, and that has a fan or something, I, you know. Uh, and then, then you get a wing, because wings are super important, right? That's maybe the most important thing on the plane. Um, so we do that after we learn a little bit. And then at the end of the day, we slam, drop down, here's your jet plane. Got it all together. And you're like, what is this? I have no idea what happened. How did we get from, I asked you some questions, you know, I gave you some requirements, and you built me a bunch of pieces, and then all of a sudden I have this thing and I don't know what it is, right? So. Everyone complains how often has IT disappeared and come back with an answer and you're like, this totally missed the boat, right? How often have you then maybe been supporting IT or even, let's say you're doing a KM initiative and you roll out the big initiative. You've written this big document about how it's going to work, right? This is going to be what we do. And I plop it out there and it's massive change. And you look back and you go, well, why, why did no one do this? Why is no one interested? What, what happened along the way? Um, there's a better way to do things. This is when we talk about iteration. We talk about cycling through. So maybe the first thing you build is a paper airplane, right? It flies. You get to see what it looks like when something flies. Oh, wow, I, I did that. And these airplanes have horrible wings. So the wing must be pretty important in keeping it up and making it fly smoothly. So. I showed a paper airplane and it was something someone could see. I better do more with it. So we built a glider because we knew the wings were important. And oh, I can sit in this. OK, here's the experience. Wow, this is kind of tight, tight space. Maybe I need something with a little more space. I don't think the airlines went agile on that front. Um, so then we get better and we build a prop plane. Yet again, something you can use, right? Now we get in it. Oh, this is better. Kind of loud. That, that little propeller goes pretty fast. And you know, if we hit things, that's not very good. You know, birds, those propellers seems a little slow. I wish we could make this better. Now we get the jet plane. But all along the way, the people that have been part of this process learned a bit each step of the way. right? They saw what was coming. And when that jet plane came out the door, there wasn't a big shock of, oh my gosh, what is this? right? I just saw a jet engine. <laughs> no, it was, I saw it all along the way. So try, try to do an analogy to show you kind of some of the value of iterating and building things and looking at them and changing. Last slide on Agile. Anyone ever done waterfall project where you start with requirements or planning? Let's, let's take this in the business world. I've got a big plan. And then I'm going to design my plan. Maybe it's a marketing plan. I'm going to design what I do. And then we'll, we'll go build it. And then we're going to launch it, right? You know, and way to go. Well, here's, here's the nightmare. This is a project. Maybe it's three months for each of these phases. You're six months before anyone's putting their fingers to the keyboard. 
how do they know what's really going to happen? You've been planning for three months, design, six months really, planning and designing, because you think, you know, almost we all arrogantly thought we knew enough to plan things without ever having seen it. Then you go to development and testing gets crunched because development was long and we ran into surprises and then we launched and no one saw it. So if you think about the impact of too much planning, you're actually creating risk, you're likely delaying your project, and you're definitely surprising your users, and usually not a good surprise. Right? Surprise and delight. This is kind of surprise and dropped a bomb on you. Sorry, guys. So there's a lot of reasons not to do this type of old school approach and to really jump in and, and be agile. So let me stop there for a second. Does everyone got enough agile? Everyone understand where I'm coming from here? Are you thinking about how you would apply it to knowledge management yet? Because we're going to try. OK. So let's talk about some similarities between uh, agile and, and a lot of KM concepts. Um, Agile is always doing retrospectives. We're always learning and getting better. We're learning. Learn before, learn, learn during, learn after. Anyone familiar with those phrases, right? That's very similar to, to, to the whole concept that you want in place for knowledge management. Um, Agile relies on transparency. Um, people need to know what's going on. There shouldn't be a lot of surprises. Well, so Agile's trying to push transparency. KM's trying to create transparency. Find those documents. Tell me where things are, right? And then, then you talk about silos. Big, big word in the KM world. How do we break down silos, right? Well, what Agile did is they said, we're going to take a bunch of people from different disciplines and throw them together and make them a team. We're going to break that silo really quickly, right? Now, that works on a micro level, not on a macro level. And we'll talk about that. Um, and in both cases, and I think this is important, uh, the goal is to improve both performance and job satisfaction. Um, I implemented Agile at GSA for our, our document management team, and I'm going to talk about that a couple of times because it's a fun project. Um, one of our consultants on the team calls us Team Awesome because he has so much fun doing it. And it's because he's empowered. It's because he can really do stuff and he sees things happening, right? And that's, that's so important that we, we're making it that way. And by the way, we're working faster. So maybe we are saving a little money. Um, and then in both cases, we spend a lot of time facilitating, getting people to talk and encouraging how they work together. So what's different? Well, Agile is really focused on, I'm going to do a project. Right? The Maximum Agile team is, is, you know, it's seven people plus or minus two. <laughs> right? So it's nine people. Um, so it's really much more very targeted and focused. KM is trying to solve actually a, a bigger and harder problem, right? You're trying to get people to break down silos across the entire enterprise. Right? So Agile kind of said, we're going to do this, and that'll solve that problem. And it, it's specific. KM has a little broader reach and in, in many ways more challenges. So while they're doing a lot of things similar, that's a big difference between the two. Um, and, and again, KM has an enterprise focus as we think about it, right? You, you're usually trying to cre create, get rid of these silos by encouraging different groups to speak to each other, right? Maybe that don't before. So, okay. So that's a bit about the two. Now, uh, for those that have worked with us, and I think a few of us, a few may know enterprise knowledge, we do, as a company, everything from strategy and roadmaps. So we come in and help different organizations get a plan for KM, right? Through actually building and delivering solutions, through kind of getting it launched <laughs> and adopted, that whole change management piece. And, and the fun thing is, we've actually applied Agile to all three phases of this. And you know, a lot of you are running your own KM shops here. And, and I, I'm going to give some examples. And what I hope you can do is you can take from this some ideas that you can bring back to yourself as to how you can build your strategy and roadmap in an agile way, how you can encourage delivery both on the business and technical side to do things iteratively, and then how all of this affects change management. So 
uh, these, these pictures are on many of our uh, proposal decks because it's, it's really truly what we do. And, and uh, the right-hand side, has anyone ever used Trello? Jira? Okay, different agile things. It's actually made by the same maker of Confluence. Uh, we, we use both, but we actually prefer Trello. Um, but it's, it's a nice tool for planning what you do. And it has the classic thing. If you know Agile, you typically have, and Scrum, you typically have a sprint, right? And you have a, your, your full backlog of everything you eventually want to do, anything that's blocked, what you're doing this sprint, this two-week iteration, right? What's in progress and what's done. Very visible and open. So when we engage with customers, we get this. And I have one who used to always add to my board. I got one and I did something or they moved it across because it wasn't just us doing work. It was often our clients. They'd move it across. So that's important. But so when we come in and do our strategy, uh, we actually do two week sprints. So we might do an eight to 12 week strategy and it'll be broken into little sprints because we're going to show you along the way what we've done. So we, we start writing our reports right away. We start doing things so it's visible to you. Um, and having said that, we typically send three days of a week interviewing and two days writing. Um, and a lot of people are like, well, how can you write? In fact, our team, so I said, well, how can we write? We don't have all the information. Write what you know. And guess what? Share it with people because they're going to tell you if it's right or wrong. So we really take this, this iterative process. This has nothing to do with an IT project. This is how we build our, our thing. We often use things like Google Docs so that we're showing you the document as it's being written. The idea is be as transparent as possible and get buy-in. Um, uh, yeah, no, I want to. And why is this important? So I'm going to use GSA as another example. Uh, they asked us to put together a plan because they had, they said they had seven document management systems. I think they had 20, right? When you, you peel away the onion, wow, there's a lot of these. They said, we need a strategy for document management. And you gotta tell us what to do. So we, we ran our workshops, we, we did this process, and this was, this was longer than, this, this took a bit. But along the way, we were showing everyone what we were doing. Every two weeks, we had a sprint review and we said, here's what we built. And I remember in August of 2014, we finished. And we had said that we're gonna move every single document in GSA onto one single document management platform. That was our recommendation. And it was going to cost $12 million after all the cost savings that we were going to generate by even license savings and, and centralizing stuff. Um, and it was going to take five years to roll out. Right? That, that was, that was the, the message. Guess how long it took to approve that and get the project started? Now we're talking federal government, GSA. Two years. One month. <laughs> yep, by September the project was approved and we were off and running. Do you know why? Because the entire time we were there everyone knew what was coming. There were no surprises. So as you're putting together your plans, find a way to, to act different. Find a way to say, this is how we do things. We're showing you along the way. And it was funny. We went to present. And everyone walked in the room, and they already knew. They knew everything was on the deck. Yeah, we've heard this. It was almost like, why are you telling us again? <laughs> we've heard this all this time. So GSA actually moves faster than other agencies, so, so that, that's probably uh, set. But they don't move that fast. This happened because for three months, they knew what was coming. And that was a big difference. And it was because of this process. So... Think about that as you're starting to build your own kind of roadmaps and plans. Um, well, when we build the roadmaps, uh, we really focus on iterative task-based plans. Now, roadmaps by definition end up looking kind of Gantt charty and, and waterfally, right? They, they, they just do. But what we focus on is you're going to build this in, in two months and you're going to build this in two months. And there's a couple reasons we do that. One, um, as we all know, CAM isn't always the first place to get budget, right? That's, you're, you're, you're not a revenue generating system in many ways. And so how do you get money? Well, one way you can 
make sure you get funding. Typically, you can get funding for a small CAM project or two, right? But if you show success and you show quick delivery, people go, wow, that's working. And if you create a lot of noise, right? Those see me, I have some energy. Create a lot of noise. Then people go, wow, I keep hearing about that project. Some, something must be good there. And people are happy. I'll give some more money to that. So when we do our plans, and you can see here, these, these arrows are short. These are in months or two months to turn things around. And not only that, everything is measurable. And, and we start with, uh, I call them, uh, so we call it measurable success criteria. But the success criteria of a measurable success criteria is it is something I can email out when it happens. So it could be, we built a taxonomy, right? And I can classify content. And then I'll, I'll write something that says, we now have the ability to identify this type of content. And it's queued up so that one month into the project, someone's writing reports to senior management that says, look what we did. Look what changed. This happened. This happened. And that's happening on a recurring basis. And suddenly it becomes expected in the norm that this KM initiative is really making things happen. Because you're hearing it and you're hearing measurable success criteria. Right? The other thing is obviously you start to get some ROI. If you can save some money and you can do it early, then they're going to be willing to invest more in it. Right? It is a game where every project is competing for ROI. So if you're the one that delivers something faster and sooner, and you're the one that comes to the table and says, look what I did. Um, and then the other thing about this is, and we tell everyone this, is here's our roadmap. And you know from us, this is all wrong. <laughs> we don't tell that to senior management, but the person we're working with. Because you're going to implement a couple of these and go, that really worked. Not so much. And wow, that changed everything. So I want to do something different. right? And so at GSA, uh, while I still help with the project, one of the things I have to do is update our roadmap with the changes every three months because we have to present that to executive leadership. And I have to say, oh, the new, new change is this. And initially that was hard. Now it's kind of gotten, so what's, what's changed now? They, they actually are used to it and like it. So um, then when you're delivering on Agile, and I've, I've talked a lot about this, show something, right? Um, we did a, a large project for the National Park Service. Uh, called the Common Learning Portal. And actually, it's, it's, a, it's an entire uh, learning ecosystem, everything from social to uh, you know, structured learning to unstructured sharing of documents, all in one place for the Park Service, um, that actually delivers information they call at the end of the trail, because at the Park Service, everything's on a trail. Um, and to do that, it started very small. And we started with a slide that looked like that. A set of boxes that said, this is the kind of functionality that this system needs to have. Right? And then we all got together. And we got on a whiteboard. We started building taxonomies. Right? What does this look like? What's important here? What's the information? And we took pictures of this. Love whiteboarding. If anyone's ever been to our office, we actually have a a round room that is one giant whiteboard, because <laughs> we like whiteboards. Um, but we got it up here. And then the very next thing we did, low fidelity wireframes. This is our paper airplane. We were showing people stuff all along, getting them excited. This went from a small pilot project for one group in the Park Service to what is now uh, has 300 authors, has been rolled out across the entire Parks, National Park Service, and will soon be rolled out publicly for everyone, everyone involved. Uh, I think it's 17,000 people now, and then I guess the number gets bigger when it's opened all. You know, and, and we finished with something that looked a little more attractive and then built it. So even if we couldn't build right away, we were still showing measurable iterative proj progress along the way um, and keeping the excitement. So I want to talk about um, two other examples. Uh, one is that uh, GSA document management project. Uh, so 
we, a lot of us work in large organizations. Uh, how often do you deal with fiefdoms? So I, I own my, my area and you can't touch it, right? I come into play, especially in KM, I want to work with you and I, I own this. Yeah, that was, there were 20 content management systems and every one of them was owned by someone. And even if people hated the tool, the IT owner said, well, you can't touch this one, this is critical. You can maybe replace the others. So we had to figure out how to roll out across the entire organization. Magic. Yeah, so we had to prove it, right? And get people conf confident to use it. And so what we said is, we're not doing a big bang. We're actually, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build minimum viable product. And we built something that was, can't really see it well here, but pretty plain Jane, right? Not, not, not that cool looking. We said, but it works. And we took a group that we knew was engaged and interested and, and we, we built their solution. And we added features when we built it. They didn't need security, but the second group did, right? And we said, okay, so now we've got a first group. And, we went through that process with them, and we learned with them, and, and we built this thing out. Um, and they started to brag about us. And the other thing we did, and this was kind of neat, is we, we actually created, so you have, in Agile, there's a common methodology people follow in Agile is called Scrum. And you have a sprint, and at the end of that Scrum process, you have a sprint review. And typically, that's given to your stakeholders. We actually made ours a public sprint review. We said, at the end of every three weeks, we're gonna show whoever wants to see this system what we've built or what we haven't built. And it was open. We've had as many as 50 or 60 people pop onto this call just because they were curious. Um, but what was happening is during those sprint reviews, the group that was, we were talking to next started listening. And the old group started bragging about what they got. And they also knew that the next group might give them a new feature because we built new features as new groups came on. So the next group needed security. And so the first group said, oh great, because I have some secure stuff, I'll add that later, right? So then we got some security in. And then word got going around the building. You know, wait a minute, does that handle security? Well, yeah, so-and-so's using it for security. The key was to get one or two groups on first and to build it iteratively over time. So uh, what, what that did is it, it did a number of things for us. One, it created great momentum. Some of those groups that uh, said, you're not taking over my system, their users came to them and said, uh, we're not using your system because we hear great things about that one and they tell us what's going on, right? That's, that's a big deal. Um, and Oh, I heard someone said this. We became the talk of the, of the hallways. And by the way, document management systems are not the talk of the hallways, right? So the bar had to be pretty low that we got people excited about that. Really, what was the problem? Other systems weren't talking. They weren't transparent and they weren't iterating. So they didn't let people know about it. Um, the other thing that, that this, this gave us was, uh, and I still remember this, uh, as this will happen, three years in, it was actually last year, um, the CFO said, I don't know what this is and we need to cut money, right? Because federal budgets were tight. Let's get rid of this EDMS thing. I don't see where that fits because we didn't have a, we were everyone's. And uh, so he was gonna do it. He was gonna try to cut it out of the next budget. And um, at a meeting to, where he thought he would do this and every leader in every business unit came to the meeting and said, what are you doing? And the only reason they did that is because they had heard from their people that this was interesting and this was making a difference. And then they said no, and he, th this person actually said, did you guys try to side stripe? He actually went to someone in IT and said, did you try to set, set me up? And they said, no, you did this to yourself. This was the excitement that was around this. We never got asked again about, about that. We, we really had that momentum in the budget and continue to. So that's, that's a system implementation. Um, uh, we talked about, you've heard about governance, I'm sure, a lot today. Governance is tricky to get started, not always fun. Um, I think the speaker before me talked about it being your, your, your youngest child, and uh, I kind of liked that. Um, so working at a major insurance company uh, with a woman who was starting to roll out governance um, around search and content management, and you know, said, how do we get going? And I said, let's get going. And so the first thing she did is she said, 
what reports do I have that tell me what content people are looking at? Well, really none. What do I have here? So she talked to IT, got a couple reports built, and found, wait a minute, I can see the most common search terms. These have no content for them, so we need to fill that in. These, we have the wrong answers. Maybe I can go to promotions and pump them to the top. She just made those changes. That was, that was kind of iteration number one, sprint one in that message. And then she went out and said to everyone, hey, I got these reports going. We're now meeting regularly. And here's the change we made. And everyone said, oh my gosh, search is better. They then built a new report based on what they learned that said, how often do people select my promoted items on a search as opposed to what's there? And the answer was 70%. So then she went and told everyone, hey, the answer is 70%. This is what I've done. So clearly, I fixed search. So she grew, we called her the search product owner. She grew that tiny little space into something that as, as we continue, as I continue to watch it grow, she will not only own search for the internet, I believe when this is done, she will own search across the entire organization. And this is a uh, 50,000 people, major, everyone knows the name, uh, insurance company in Boston. Um, so you can start small, do something, brag about it. Measure it, brag about it. Do something else, measure it, brag about it. Do something else. Measure it, brag about it. Right? And all of a sudden what you find is you're the one making the noise. You're the one that people go, I keep hearing good things here. So this is worth doing. So the next time you're putting together a plan, be it governance, be it IT project, be it you know, even a marketing initiative, what about try, test, try again. When you get it right, brag about it. What about changing the way you do things? Um, it can make a big difference. So change management. This is the last piece of it. And, it. and it's funny. We used to think of that as this huge thing. And we still, by the way, still draw a big line that says you need change management throughout your project. right? Because it is a challenge, right? You want to create adoption. You want people to understand what they have. And you also want them to, to not feel overwhelmed by it. So we handle that. The Agile process just naturally brings that forward. So we do iterations. So you're seeing something along the way, right? When we were at GSA in that document management system, if anyone wanted to look at it, they could see every new feature being built. And we recorded those sessions so they could see them, right? So th th they, were, they could see what was coming and they could visualize it. It is so much easier to critique something that you see than to try to figure something out that you don't see. Transparency. We, we were an open book, like an open book to the point that you could watch us move our Trello board of each task we did. We didn't even show you the end system. We showed you the work we were doing while we were doing it, right? What that does, it's shocking. People, when you're not around, um, and I had to tell a, a, a young consultant this, uh, he had started working, he was really working hard, and I said, have you talked to your client? Well, no, I got to get this stuff done. Do they know you're here today or working with them? Well, no, I've, I've, I've I got a lot of work to do. Get out of your chair. Tell your client at lunch and when you show up, I'm here. This is what I'm doing. And then the client's always like, wow, so-and-so is always working hard. You know, people forget if you're not telling people what you're doing, they don't know. Right? You're not paying they're not paying attention to you. They're paying attention to their own problems. So find a way to be transparent and make it clear and easy for people to see what you're doing. Even if you think you're failing, they'll go, wow, something's happening. And it's amazing how much that makes a difference. Cl collaboration. Um, I, I hate, hate, hate contract negotiations. I hate all that stuff. Because I hate the idea of we're going to draw a line in the sand and say, this is what we're doing and we're not changing. Right? Because what if we find a better way? Right? And, and why do we have to fight before we start? Why is step one to argue? Right? Does that seem like a, a, a good relationship? W what if we said, as opposed to arguing, how do we get to the end point? Right? Now, contracts and legal things, they have to happen. That's, that's protection for everyone. But as you work with people, bring them in, draw them in. Right? You know, this isn't my problem to solve KM. Hey, how do we do this together? Use those we terms a lot. Turn it into 
joint problem solving, not get, let me get your commitment and I demand it. Right? Guess what? If they stop working with you, it probably means you haven't engaged them enough. It probably means you haven't done something that they care about enough to work with you. So if that happens, go back and try again. Right? You're planning to change. Um, metrics. Part of getting adoption is being the system everyone wants to be on, right? Or being, being the thing that's happening. Uh, senior management is busy. They get a ton of stuff. That little hallway conversation, hey, I just did this. Eh. Yeah, I remember that among seven other things I heard in the last hour. No, right? Find a way to communicate through statistics and metrics. Management will get it, and users will get it. When people started to hear EDMS, that we had this percent of coverage, right, and that we had this many business units on or this many documents, then that question of can we handle security goes away because, wow, there's, those are some big numbers. That, that must be something. Even if they weren't necessarily that big comparatively, they seemed big. So that communication not only helps people see what's happening, it, it creates adoption because people want to be part of something that's working. Um, and then continuous improvement. Uh, it never hurts to ask someone, how did I do? Frankly, you're not going to get better unless you do. And there's nothing more valuable than you deliver something to someone, even if you totally missed, and you say, how'd I do? And, and they say, not, not well. Right? Now, there's a ton of people that are afraid to, oh, that didn't go well, I don't want to ask them. When you ask and they say it didn't go well, and then you say, this is how I'll fix it. What you just did to your user is, one, you gave them a chance to tell you what was missing so you could do it better. Two, and equally as important, you showed them that you're listening. We all want to be heard, right? We don't all want to be talked to or pushed to. It's that sales rep you talk to and you say, I want to buy a TV. Here's the best one for you, right? <laughs> no one wants that or that used car sales rep. What you want is someone says, tell me what you need and let me understand that. Well, that's the same with any initiative you're pushing out, be it technical or business. What could I do better? How could I change things and work better for you? For you, right? That, that really, those words, we and for you, those are powerful words. And that starts to create adoption because you get it better, you, you, you do it better and you show them that you're doing it better, right? And they see it. So a lot of reasons to focus on that. And all of these things together really enable change management. You know, because of the iterations, you're not having to deliver a 17-page instruction manual or 70-page instruction manual, right? Because people saw it along the way. They learned incrementally. You know, all these things together make that process of changing life for someone significantly better and, and, and meaningful. So, I talked for a while, as I'm known to do, uh, but I want you to walk away with, with three really key points here to try to remember, if nothing else. Um, one, Agile's a mindset, uh, and it can be applied to both business and technical stuff. Apparently, everyone knew that you could use it on business and technology. I don't know if everyone knew that it was a mindset and a way of thinking. Start thinking that way. Read some stuff about it. You'll see that. You'll hear. Search for Agile Mindset and you'll get some really good stuff by people who actually know what they're talking about. Two, Agile and KM, I think, marry well, really well together. So when Enterprise Knowledge was formed, Zach and I talked about what we would do and we said, well, we know KM, we're going to be a KM shop, but we're going to do Agile too. And a lot of people at first said, well, that's just a fad and you're jumping on the hot stuff. And we said, no, kind of, it's how we work. And actually, when Zach and I make business decisions, we go, well, let's try something small and see what happens, right? We, we, we run the company that way because we, we're more effective that way, right? And then lastly, you can see and hopefully you can remember from some of what I discussed, the different aspects of any KM life cycle that you can apply agile thinking to. Everything from that strategy and roadmap through delivery, through creating adoption and change management. So I'm done. 
feel free to ask me questions. And if you have none, we can probably go get drinks soon. But uh, any questions? Okay. Thank you, everyone.